Okay. All right. Welcome, fans. Fans of British rock. The beginning of British rock. Here we are. We are going to start today's episode. We are going to break down our top favorite Who albums from worst to best. And none other than Mr. Tom Jennings, the man, the myth, the legend. Welcome. I'm not sure if I necessarily want to be a myth. I mean, that just means that there's... (laughs) I'm a man. I'm a I'm a legend. I mean, man, legend. Those are all good. But who wants to be a myth? I mean, King Arthur. I mean, he's not even real, is he? Maybe he is. I don't know. <laughs> well, Same. anyhow, it's been a little while since we had an episode <laughs> here. Uh, good to see you. Happy New Year. Our first episode for 2022. Now I'm starting to lose track. Wow. Yeah, I didn't realize that. That's cool. Yeah. So let's dig so, in. Uh, so, so who are we going to be talking about today? Well, I'd say let's let's. <laughs> <laughs> who are you? <laughs> who are you? No, oh, yeah. Who should next? be a fun one? <laughs> Who's next? To all these, yeah, great up. You know, it, it's amazing. You know, obviously, we're going to be doing the who, but uh, I, I mean, these guys have been around for what 50, 53, 54 years, maybe longer. Yeah, and uh, they don't have a lot of records out. It's kind of crazy. I was. I was looking at that and thinking, man, you know, they really just didn't put out a lot of records. Them and the Eagles. I mean, they managed to kind of survive on a very small catalog of really good albums. So oh, yeah. uh, we, we've definitely got some good albums to talk about. But um, and then I was surprised, too, that there were some songs, some of my favorite Who songs were never on a proper album, including, right. according to my list, Substitute, I Can't Explain. Uh, the Seeker and Pictures of Lily. I mean, yeah. and there's and there's plenty more that just they wind up on compilation albums, but we're never on. And I'll th- I think Long Live Rock was. I think that was on like a compilation album yeah. as well. I don't think it was ever on a proper Who record. So uh, interesting, interesting history of this band. But man, did they put out some great music? <laughs> you ain't just kidding. I mean, uh, you look back on the British bands of the '60s, and I always call it consider who one of the big four because you got the Beatles obviously who yep rule all according to most people although not to me <laughs> I love the right. Beatles but I don't love them any more than any of the other bands um the who they're also you know and uh, the Rolling Stones also came from that piece of pie there and the last band who probably gets the least amount of respect out of that fo- the foursome the Kinks Yep. Very, 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 uh, probably the greatest underrated band of all time, in my opinion. Uh, but, um, today's segment is going to be the who, and, uh, you know, they, they got back, they got together, started things out way back, way back when, um, but their first album came out actually in 66. So that was a little, a little late to the game, but, uh, the who sing my generation was their first album. And believe it or not, it failed the chart in the U.S. <laughs> Who would have thought, you know? That they, do you know what else? Do you know what else came out in 1966? Me? You're gonna, you're gonna tell me. <laughs> I was, I was born in 1966. So. Oh wow! Yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> so if you look at, if you look at how old I look, that's how old the Who is. That's uh, pretty scary. <laughs> Except 20 years more older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at exactly. least for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, but anyhow, we're gonna start breaking down the 12 studio albums now when we say studio albums we're talking about actual bona fide studio albums now obviously if you look back at their career you know the first album was generally a few singles thrown into it they kind of just you know made it the who sing my generation uh but like you mentioned a lot of these uh songs of theirs were very popular singles that just never made it on any of the albums so they they came out with a compilation called Odds and Sods. And man, th- that one is probably the greatest <laughs> compilation of songs that never appeared on albums. Uh, that and uh, another one I would say would be the Kinks famous one, the Great Lost Kinks album. Another one where mm-hmm. all these tracks were never released on proper albums that found, wound up on, a, on another album like that. Um, they were yeah, never... the Beatles. The Beatles had one too that had like "Hey Jude" and a couple other ones. So, 
Yeah. All right, so let's get started here. Uh, we're gonna we're just ranking the twelve studio albums. Uh, what do you got for your number twelve, sir? Well, I think we're gonna start out this one in agreement, and that is the uh, man "Endless Wire," which uh, I like to I like to nickname "Endless Garbage." <laughs> it is just uh, it is an awful awful album. Probably the only one on the list I can honestly say that I just never appreciate it i mean there's some songs on there like the fragments bits that uh, were kind of reminiscent of the who are you and who's next era but for the most part i mean this this album is just it just lacks energy it's the uh i don't even know if entwistle was on this record i think he wasn't i think this came out just after entwistle died so it was probably just daltrey and uh townsend and i think uh you know, it would have been a subpar Daltrey solo album. It certainly wouldn't have been a great Townsend solo album, but I, I don't know. I, I find this record almost unlistenable. And, and in all honesty, I mean, I revisit it every now and then in hopes that I'll find some redeeming qualities to it, but I'm just, I'm just at a loss. Uh, and especially after the band had, had, had not recorded an album for so long, it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't mean to be, that harsh but i just don't even I, I can't really polish this turd as the old expression goes wow all right well uh i don't agree with you on that one so we got we wow. started off differently <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I mean, we I mean but i mean friends <laughs> <laughs> but i but i think uh my mine is my next one maybe your next one so we probably just had two of these reversed we'll see um mine is yeah. actually the 2019 release the who album um you mm. know I, for some reason that one i just couldn't get into as much as any of the other who albums i mean you know there's a few songs on there that are all right you know don't get me wrong um but for the most part there's some stuff on there that just make make me cringe <laughs> um so yeah that, that that's just not uh the album for me this one is a little bit weaker than endless wire um but not by much <laughs> they're they're in the same oh. ballpark unfortunately so <laughs> that's all, that's all i got well, we, are, for we, we are gonna have some early disagreements for sure so because well, that's uh, why that we, is definitely higher on my list oh wow. that's why we well, do this that's why we do this that's why we do this <laughs> all, right, all right so well. my number 11 is uh actually the first album the who sings my generation which uh oh. obviously obviously the song my generation is a is a classic but uh i you know I, I feel like the the reason and, and, and the kids are all right is on there as well. So they have they have two classics that have remained in their set list probably and will until they stop performing live. So that yeah, there's two great songs on it. But the rest of it to me is kind of filler and uh, it sounds dated. And I think I think if they had included songs like I Can't Explain or Substitute and some of the earlier songs on it, it would have been a much stronger album. But I don't know, this album just doesn't do it for me. I mean it I, I think it uh I think it just sounds very, it just sounds very 1960s. It doesn't, it's, it, it doesn't really, doesn't really foreshadow how great this, this band is eventually going to become. Well, the Beatles album sound like it belonged, came out in 1960s too, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I just, I feel like the Who Sings My Generation, a lot of that stuff just sounds like everything else that was coming out at the time. I mean, I, I agree that the early Beatles albums, they definitely had a, a kind of a sound but i think a lot of i think they were the first people to, to first band to really have that sound and a lot of bands kind of mimicked it and if anything you can almost make the case that the who here was kind of like you know an amalgam of uh the beatles and the stones i mean it just didn't it just wasn't at, at that, that point i just don't think that they really were the great band that they would become and i, I think their stronger material was definitely in the 70s i mean their stuff in the 70s is better than i think anybody was putting out at the time and more innovative in, in many ways as well. All right. Well, so let's see. So mine, obviously I mentioned Endless Wire. So that's what mine is. Now Endless yeah. Wire, um, this was your number 12. Uh, but for number 11 for me, um, you know, there's there's some fragments of decent songs on here, like you mentioned. Fragments, yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's see what you did there. Well, the mini opera, you know, you kind of got that opera that's supposed to all fit nicely together, uh, the wire and glass mini opera. But yeah, there's a few good songs. We got a hit, um, Tea in Theater, which was one of the songs that Who actually played on their last tour acoustically, which went over pretty well. Um, you know, so, I mean, Mike Post theme, there's a few songs that kind of stood out a little bit, um, you know, but not not a, not the type of album that, you know, I was expecting from them, you know, being 2019, you know, I just figured, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I doubt we'll see another Who album, although there's always talk of one, who knows. I guess we'll see a lot of uh, stuff come out, probably older stuff that was never released down the road. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff like that in the vaults that we'll end up getting at some point. But as far as new Who music written by Townsend, I, I just don't see anything else coming at this point in their career. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. My, I mean, TN Theater, I, I just, uh, it sucked to me as a snoozer. <laughs> it really is. I remember I saw them on not long after the album came out in uh, Hamilton, Ontario, and that was their final encore. And I think it had kind of a, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was just Townsend Adultery on stage. And I think they might've done the same thing in later tours and, I guess for sentimental value, it's it's kind of cool, but it doesn't really come off as a as a who song. It's said it's more sort of like a latter career, whatever you know, ballad. So, cool. all right. Well, we'll leave that endless wire right there. And we'll endless on. wire is gone. We are okay. we are over the. It is not endless. It is done. <laughs> <laughs> it is over. Yeah. All right, let's get your number ten out of the way here. What do you got for ten? Uh, my number ten is that that Who record, uh, just uh, just called the Who, the 2019 one. And, and honestly, I, I like this record. There's there's some redeeming qualities to it. It definitely is better than Endless Wire. And uh, I give it the higher ranking because I think even in terms of, I'll tell you, the difference between Endless Wire and Who to me is uh, Daltrey's vocals. And I think Daltrey might've even had some kind of surgery on his vocal cords to repair some damage. And uh, so in turn, it just, I feel like it's a much stronger vocal performance. And, you know, ultimately that, that kind of carries the album. The song uh, Detour is a fun one. I really like that. Uh, I think it's got, I think it's got some good punch to it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've listened to it a fair amount. You know, I, I have it on vinyl. And uh, I've enjoyed listening to it. Would I put it in the category of great Who albums? No, but I think, as mm. I said, I think it, at least if nothing else, it sounds more like the Who that I remember than Endless Wire, which sounds more like a kind of a Townsend vanity project, if that makes sense. All right. Well, real quick, I'll just mention one song on this one that I didn't mention before that I feel probably the best song out of the album, probably out of the, the last two Who albums there is Break the News. I really like that one. That one stands out. That was actually written by Simon Townsend, Pete's brother. So that that song actually sticks out real good if you actually play this album. Um, it's very catchy. And that's probably the, probably the catchiest Who song out of the two albums, I would have to say. Yeah. And that's how I'll leave that one. And we're done talking about this one too, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, it's, 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 you know, the, the who, and it's weird because with these records, you don't have Ant Whistle, you don't have moon. I mean, there's going to yeah. be other ones that we'll talk about that don't have moon, but I mean, the classic classic lineup is the four. And I think even when we were about to do this, I was almost going to say, you know, maybe we should do the ones with a classic four, but I think that the, you know, we'll get to it's hard and face dances, but these two, uh, Endless Wire and Who, are just really, they're just outliers. I mean, they're kind of post, you know, I don't know. There's no pressure on them to really sell records by the time these things came out. So, again, I think they're more well, it's just the two projects. Of them. Yeah, it's just the two of them, you know, Roger and uh, Pete. And, and that's yeah. why I think, in my opinion, estimation, too, I think that's why they, they rank a lot lower than the rest of the catalog. So, yeah. um, all right. Sure. I'm going to give you my number 10. Okay. The Who Sell Out. Oh, dear. 1967. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one for me, I, I'm just not a fan. And uh, I mean, I like I like the cover and uh, and the concept behind things, but it just to me it just didn't really do anything. I mean, you got all these commercials mixed in here through the songs, and 
you know, the only song that they still even touch these days anymore is I Can See for Miles, you know. And other yeah. than that, there really wasn't a lot to um to really stick out. It was more it's more like a gimmick type of album the way they put these commercials in here. Um you know, so for me, I don't know, I just as an album it just doesn't flow that good because you're getting this commercial popping in and this and that and I don't know. I just I just can't get into it as as much as the other albums. That's why this one is a little bit lower than for the from the classic lineup size. This is a little bit lower for me. Yeah, I I'm I'm not far off, but I I, I agree with everything you said. It's it's uh uh you know, it, it it definitely it's one of those those things where I think the band was uh, it was creative. I mean, it was a great idea. It was a great concept, but I think it, it was just kind of hard to pull off. And um, I know that there, I think my son recently purchased a vinyl edition that just came out of the, like an extended version of it stuff. It was really cool packaging and everything. He really loves this record, but uh, the who sell out, but I'll, I'll talk more about it when I get to that on my list. Okay. Um, and my number nine is, mm -hmm. A, uh, a quick one or in the United States, it was called uh, Happy Jack. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, um, I will say that in this, this particular record, it's probably the best contributions from uh, Keith Moon. And uh, he did this song called I Need You, which is a fun song. And of course, John, the ox entwistle, he had Boris the spider. Now, you know, the, there's some other great John entwistle songs, but man, Boris, of course, is the, is the classic and in concert it was just really cool to hear him sing that one and uh the other one was you know the quiet one obviously was a was a big one from him too but you know Ed Twistle had some great contributions um I, you know the importance of a quick one is it really does kind of set the stage for Tommy you have the whole rock opera thing going on and uh you know but but it I mean the 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 whole mini opera that they had, I just, again, I don't think it's, it's anywhere near as good as, as what Tommy eventually became. It just kind of foreshadowed the potential for a rock opera. Yeah. And this is also my number nine, so that we can keep talking no, here. Nice. Um, yeah. 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 Believe it or not. Number nine. Um, yeah. Boris the Spider. That was a, a high point of a concert because Entwistle got to get, get his turn on the microphone on that one. Yeah. Um, I got to see that on the uh, 89 tour, thankfully, twice. <laughs> uh, so that was cool. So sad about us. That was, that's one of the most covered songs, believe it or not, by The Who, believe, believe it or not. Matter of fact, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, I believe Mr. Rundgren produced the Sean Cassidy version of that song from the Wasp album. You, you, sir, would be correct. <laughs> yes, the uh, the Wasp album, which uh, which just yeah, just just recently came out. They came out with a nice yellow version of that uh, for Record Store Day as well. So yeah, I I, uh, I had I had forgotten that. It's a it's an it's, that uh, Tron Cash album is a very interesting one, of course. But uh, yeah, and it's that's another. I mean, so this you know we're kind of getting into the territory where there's not really bad albums it's just you know there's albums that have weaknesses and i think this is one of the ones that just again i i think in many ways it sounds dated even even in some ways even more dated than the the, the first album who sings my generation all right well let's uh let's mosey on down to number eight well my eight is the who sell out and for all the reasons that you said so i don't really need to reiterate yeah. that uh yeah my notes was just uh, i can see for miles is the song that definitely still sticks out um you know i've given this album a, a few listens and i enjoy it but i think it's it's not one that you necessarily go back to on a on a regular basis it's uh you know it's a uh, it's a cool cover i like the big old can of baked beans and everything out front <laughs> of it, but, uh, which the beans the the beans thing thing there which is interesting is that um you know, that famous scene in the Tommy movie where the beans are coming out of the TV set that was inspired by that because they had the beans and I think they had suds coming out and something else, but that's all kind of an homage to uh, the Who Sell Out. So that's your trivia for the day. <laughs> and the Wasp trivia. A lot of and the Wasp, yeah, you got you got one. me on the Wasp one, which I should know because I'm a big Todd Rundgren <laughs> fan, obviously. <laughs> All right, so All right, you're up. 
Yep, number number eight for me is an album that actually made it to number eight on the charts. Went gold back in 1982. Yes, it's the uh, the Who. It's hard. Mm, yeah, number number eight. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's just seven better albums in this one and i'm not saying that this i mean there's a lot of good stuff on this one uh well not a lot of good stuff but there's there's definitely a good handful of songs on here that definitely uh stands out you know athena obviously was one of those uh radio tracks didn't do really do much as a single too much but it you know it definitely was um played a lot on the radio and this that was the that one in uh eminence front of course were the two big ones uh from this album and actually, oddly enough, Athena, they, the Who never really played it much after this tour. And they didn't even actually play it much on this tour, actually. Uh, they kicked it out after a while. But the cool thing was I saw Daltrey. I can't remember. What it, was, it was about 2017, I believe. He played uh, a, a solo show up here. Um, and he actually played it. And, man, it was, it was great. Great to hear you know, a song live that even the Who have stopped playing live many, many moons ago. So... Because you got to remember, if you know anything about Daltrey's backing band, it pretty much was the Who, except for the drummer and no Pete. <laughs> so it was kind of like seeing the Who, anyways, in in more respects than one. Uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. I've always loved that song. It, it's interesting because by you know they played Buffalo, a pretty famous show with the Clash and David mm-hmm. Johansson, and and they by that point time or by that point in the tour they weren't doing Athena anymore. And Athena was the lead single, which. Uh, I, I, th- I mean, I thought it was a really strong song. I think they just, I think they were just having issues performing it. I think that, that maybe, maybe it was a hard song to sing. I don't know, but uh, it's a great song. Yeah, I agree. It's one of those songs from the Who that people overlook or forget about, you know, for whatever reason. Even the radio nowadays doesn't really ever seem to play it anymore. Yeah. But, um, yeah, great song. No doubt about it. Um, you know, yeah. And there's some, you know, there's some other songs on here that stand out, and, but it just not enough to, um, you know, overshadow any of the next seven choices that I will be giving you as we go along here. All right. Well, so you had, uh, it's hard for number eight, right? Yeah. So I am up to number seven and it is face dances. <laughs> so <laughs> I was trying, you're like, what's he doing? It's my face. It's my face dancing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, interesting, obviously an interesting uh, point in the Who's career. Face Dances was the first album with Kenny Jones on drums, the first post-Keith Moon album. And interestingly enough, this one, you know, I, it, it, it came out around the same time as Pete Townsend's Empty Glass. And I know that, I mean, I've read a fair amount of books on the Who and everything. And uh, Kenny Jones always was upset that he felt like, Townsend put all of his good songs on empty glass and then saved the, <laughs> the leftovers for face dances and uh, empty glass. I mean, that's, I mean, wow. I mean, it's a great record. And I, I mean, tough boys, you know, there's, there's definitely some, some very strong cuts on that. I could see where Kenny would say that uh, Pete kind of saved some good stuff for his solo career, but who, who can blame him? It's a solo career. You know, he probably wants to, to put out some good records, but uh, nonetheless, you know, I, I mean, there's some very strong songs on here. I think Second Side's better than the first. Um, I'm definitely a fan of the song uh, You. I think Daltrey's vocal performance on that's pretty awesome. And uh, Another Tricky Day, which has got some incredible bass work by John Entwistle. Uh The lead single, You Better You Bet. Uh, yeah, kind of a kind of a hokey poppy single, but, you know, serviceable. And uh, overall, I mean, I... I, I go back to this album on a fairly regular basis and listen to it i I enjoy it i don't think it's a incredibly strong album but it's certainly not a weak album either okay yeah i'll be coming up to mine shortly so i'll save a few things for that all right so uh let's see where are we up to now numero seven Uh, that was that that was my seven that was your seven and i'm on mine yeah uh, so mine is the Who Sing My Generation, you know, like I mentioned, failed the chart in the U.S., you know, what can you do? You know, that was when they first started out. Uh, you were saying how you thought a lot of the album sounds kind of dated. Yeah, it was, 
from the 60s. What do you want? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> it's, yeah. Oh, let's make an album, make it sound like the year 2000 oh. while we're in 1966. It can't be done. But, you know, you know, this album definitely has a few good good tracks that people you know, that never get touched anymore. Um, I'm looking back at it. You know, obviously the kids are all right. My generation are the two that stood out and have yep. forever been, you know, right there. Much too much, not too bad. La 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 lies. Um, you know, that's one of those ones that uh, grows on you actually over time. Uh, the good's gone. You know, it definitely sounds sixty-ish, and it definitely sounds British. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you know, it's not a for for a debut album. I've seen a lot worse. <laughs> you know. It, oh yeah, so I don't think I don't think it's a bad album. I just think I just think by comparison, it doesn't. Uh doesn't necessarily stand up to some of the other stuff oh no definitely not that's why it's number seven for me and i can't remember what number yours was but you know but it was it's, low it was mine was just above endless <laughs> wire which is probably oh. the worst album ever made. oh boy shame <laughs> on you okay <laughs> oh uh, man there's like there's somebody out there in the uh in the universe who thinks that endless wire is an amazing record that's just going to be putting all these mean comments on our youtube page and you know that's okay i i, I respect you for that I don't mean to, I don't mean to crap all over endless wire. I mean, it's, it's like an it, endless it's like an endless criticism, right? Just I fragments guess. of criticism. So, all right, let's let's now that we're halfway through the uh, the dozen albums here, let's let's crack down. Let's crack open the six pack here. Number six. My six pack. My number six is the Who by Numbers, and uh, yeah, it's a great record. It, it's. Uh, of course, I you know I love the cover art on this. It's funny. I, I I'm a vinyl record guy, and uh, it's I, I love seeing this in the bins because sometimes people actually, you know, they got the pencil and they fill the <laughs> fill in all the little uh, by number things. But uh, you know, overall, pretty strong record. And you know, I mean, I I, I what's the big one on that with squeeze box and it's. It's it's a it's a fun listen. I mean, certainly we're getting into the the ones that have a, a whole plethora of hits. This didn't have a ton of radio play on it, but uh, still, I think it was the Who kind of getting to the point where they were starting to evolve and and develop that that '70s sound. You know, that sort of post Tommy. I think so. This is a follow up to Quadrophenia. Okay, yeah. so this is the one that came out between Quadrophenia and uh, Who, are Who Are You? Yeah. Okay. Right. So I knew it kind of, I knew it kind of uh, was before an album that I thought was a, a pretty strong release. So it was a, it was a good era for them. I mean, Quadrophenia is, you know, we'll be talking about that in a minute too, but man, I mean, that's, that's a heck of a record. Oh yeah. However, most of these left here are a heck of a records, believe me. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that yep. for sure. I don't think our ratings are going to be right exactly, but nope. uh, our top three might be the same. We'll see. All right. Mine will be the right ones. Yours, yours will be the wrong ones. That's that's oh, how I it is. You. I'm, I, have the, I have the better opinion because opinions, you know, you you, you got to be right. Everybody's got you, one. Everybody's <laughs> got one. Yeah. And you know where I'm going with that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my number six is going to be uh, what you just mentioned about an album ago. Face Dances, '81. Uh, okay. First album with um, Kenny Jones, like you had mentioned. So face dances for me, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a, better than it's hard. You know, the better of the two. You know, you had mentioned he used a lot of the stuff from Empty Glass, but uh, you know, I just love you better, you bet. And that's one of those songs that just once it starts getting rolling, man, and what a great song! I think Daltrey's that's probably his best vocal performance on this song, this album, probably overall. You's definitely up there as well. Uh, like you mentioned, um, don't let go of the coat. Weird title, <laughs> but the song itself is is pretty catchy. You know, it's not too bad. You know, kind of odd title, like I said, but uh, you know, another tricky day. That was one they played uh, on concert. You, you you would you would hear that one on the radio a little bit here and there, not too much, uh, but that. I think that and You Better You Bet were the only two that really got solid airplay on the radio at all, even from this album. Yeah, uh, yeah, You Better You Bet did. I mean, I, I seem to remember another tricky day and you getting some some airplay. And yeah. uh, I don't remember. 
remember if this one came out before Cincinnati or or after. It's I think it came out a little bit before. So I mean that kind of, I think that kind of mars it in a way. I think people associate it with that uh that tragedy in Cincinnati. But there, you know, there's some strong cuts on here. Like I said, you use a great song. I mean, you better you bets if only don't let go of the coat, you know, that's a good one too it's a like you said it's a funky one i think they they had a video for that on mtv so all right yeah so that's pretty much all i had for that one um let's see so now that brings us over to number our top five top five now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty here so my five is it's hard and i think this is probably more sentimental for me because it's it's the tour that i saw them on for the first time and that was at uh, rich stadium and Buffalo, New York in September of, I don't think, 82, maybe, 83. Um, and, uh, you know, Eminence Front, I think, is a great song. Athena, I really love. Uh, one, I don't know, one of the songs that, that has always stuck in my head is I've Known No War. Uh, you know, I, I think this is a really good album. And it's interesting because, you know, Kenny Jones is on record saying that he felt like you know, the Who Never Had a Great Album when he was with him and uh you know it's tough when you when you put out a body work like the who had with keith moon and of course kenny jones had some very big shoes to fill and uh what but but i think what kenny brought to the table that maybe you know moon didn't have i mean moon was just sort of that i mean he could he could just do a lot of things and his drums were all over the place but yet he still managed to keep good time so it, it created a lot of energy and a lot of tension. Whereas I think Kenny Jones was the kind of guy who could really keep things pretty solid. And I think this album reflects that more so than face dances. Um, Eminence front, you know, I mean, just the guitar work on it is really cool. The theme song. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I love this record. Uh, but again, I, I think, you know, we, we all have to accept the fact that sometimes our, our personal opinions are, are impacted by, what was going on in our life at the time. And, you know, I was like in high school, just starting to go to concerts when this record came out. So it, uh, it brings back a lot of great memories. So maybe it's a little higher on my list than it would be on a, somebody who was born 10 years earlier than me or 10 years later for that matter. That's kind of looking back at the whole catalog, but I, I love this record. It's just a, I guess the term that we've used in the past is it's a sentimental favorite. All right. Well, my number five, is an album that we haven't talked about yet from 1978 rose all the way up to number two double platinum you know that's actually probably their last really big selling album actually and that obviously is keith moon's final album as he would pass away a few weeks after it was released um so you know who are you 1978 um yeah, this album is one of those albums I think you've really got to have it on, play it from beginning to end to really get the gist of it. It's not one, if you're looking for singles or something like that, this definitely is not your album. You know, it had a lot of songs on here that kind of, the way they, the way the album was designed with the um, tracking, it just seems like it, it just flows pretty nicely right through. You know, obviously... Who Are You was the real main big song on it. They had uh, Sister Disco, Trick of the Light. You know, they had some other good ones on here. Uh, but for, to me, this is one of those ones that you just have to play from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree 100%. In fact, I'll just roll into it because it's my uh, it's my number four. So uh, we can transition into that very nicely. But I, I agree with 100% of what you said. It's It's a record. Like, it's an album. And it's just tracked perfectly, you know, uh, I guess there's stories that uh, at this point, at this stage, you know, Keith Moon was in pretty rough shape and it was hard to get a great performance out of him, supposedly, but you wouldn't know it listening to this record. Yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> things sound, things sound great. I mean, it, it's uh, the, the title track, of course, is iconic and, you know, it's been used for television shows and all that other stuff and Daltrey's, you know, vocals are, are amazing. And uh, this just... You know, it, it again, it's kind of a shame that Moon passed away not long after this. Uh, but I mean, it, you know, he was uh, he was kind of at a point in, in his life where he was so self-destructive. I mean, who knows how much longer he would have been able to last even in the band. I mean, he may have just had to leave just to 
maintain his health. But uh, yeah, I, I dig this album. I, I, I think it, I don't think it necessarily gets the attention that it deserves because, you know, because again, you know, the ones that we're going to be talking about very soon are just so strong that, that this one kind of pales by comparison on some level, but man, I mean, right. for a, for a fourth, uh, fourth or fifth best album, I mean, this thing's, this thing's pretty incredible. You know, to think that you can do records better than this is, uh, is pretty amazing, but they did. So yeah, not a bad cut on it. Yeah. All right. Number four for you and number four for me, obviously is going to take us to uh, an album you already talked about. So that means our top three will definitely be the same top three, but will they be in the same order? We'll find out. Uh, mine is Who By Numbers, uh, my fourth album. Uh, number eight, it reached on the charts. It went platinum, 1975. Um, you know, like you had mentioned, Squeezebox was the uh, the big song on the album there. That um, got the radio airplay. Um, this is what I when I was looking back at this album and, and giving it a good listen, a uh, really good listen. The things that stood out for me was like side one. It's like how, you know, however much I booze. Uh, what a, you know, Townsend, man, this guy, <laughs> is this guy a writer or is he a writer, man? Um, yeah. Man, unbelievable. That That's one of those songs, you know, that just makes you... He just put that to music perfectly. Um, Dreaming from the Waste, another one that uh, I just like how it all how it flows uh, a little bit better. I just like it a little bit better than Who Are You, only because of the, uh, I think it's got a little bit more variety on it. You know, it kind of gives you a lot of acoustic stuff. Then you get into something like Squeezebox, Blue, Red, and Gray, another interesting one from uh, the band there. Um. How many friends? You know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff. This is this was basically obviously written and recorded. You know, probably not in uh, you know the greatest time in Townhend's Pete's Pete's life. You know, he had a lot of writer's block and it was going through a lot of personal things and you know, and you can see that in the writing, and that's probably what makes why it, why this album stands out so much for me here. Yeah. No, well, yeah, I agree with you. And I, I, I think in terms of comparing the two records, but I think, I think who are you was a, a very safe record. Like it was just a clearly a record that was designed to sell, you know, just, just a very strong, uh, just very strong individual tracks. You know, he, he wasn't kind of bound into the whole concept or rock opera or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of, you know, really just the kind of crazy creativity of even things like, you know, the who sell out, um, it was definitely who were you was probably the safest record. So I, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's a fair assessment comparing those two records for sure. All right. Let's get down to the meat and potatoes of this who catalog, you know, the meat and potatoes. How can you have any meat if you don't eat your pudding? Anyhow. <laughs> um, speaking of rock operas, how about number three, Tommy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, number three on my list is, of course, Tommy. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, we know the other two I have to choose from from the top two. And uh, you could, on any given day, probably interchange Tommy as the number one, number two, number three album in the Who's catalog. It uh, was a groundbreaking recording. Um, you know, I think we joke about things sounding dated. Anyhow, um, so Tommy, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, you know, it, it, it just is one of those albums that's really stood the test of time. I think it still sounds very fresh. The story's uh, interesting. It's not all that difficult to follow. I think Quadrophenia is a little more difficult to follow in terms of, a, of the narrative, you know. But, uh, I don't, you know, and the Who is just, it's funny because they just go back to this one so often you know it, it's really kind of their uh kind of their bell cow so to speak they've performed it in its entirety as often as they possibly can so that says something about it and even when they're not performing the album in its entirety they're performing a pretty decent chunk of it right, but, uh, right. In, instrumental stuff i mean i don't know it, it just you know i i but here, here's another one you know we were talking about um you know who are you and i think this is very typical of of great records in general 
is that this is a record that when you put it on, you got you got to you put on whatever, whether you listen to it digitally or on vinyl or cassette or whatever, you listen to it from beginning to end because it's just it's just that kind of record. You know, you just you just love listening to it, the ebbs and the flows. But then there's these songs that you can just pull out of it that are so iconic, you know, the Pinball Wizard and uh, Tommy, can you hear me? You know, all that kind of stuff. So we're not going to take it. I mean, just, just, I, I don't know. I, I love this record. I'm free. No. I'm free. Great yep. stuff. Acid queen. I mean, you know, Christmas. Yeah. Very, very underrated song Christmas. And, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff. We're not going to take it. Like you mentioned, yeah, great stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. And we won't, you know, we won't talk about the theme of Uncle Ernie, which is a little odd, but, you know, <laughs> other than that, it's, uh, you know, especially given stuff that happened later on uh, with Townsend, but uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's really an amazing record and, and, you know, the who uh, should be very proud of this. And it, I think it, I think it paved the way for like uh, the wall, you know, Pink Floyd, the wall. I don't think Pink Floyd, the wall exists without Tommy coming before it. Interesting take. Yeah, I mean, this, this is one of those albums, and obviously this is my number two, but we're just going to continue talking about this album. Uh, that was Tom's number three. Um, yeah, I remember seeing the uh, 89 tour, you know, uh, that, which uh, they did a good chunk of this album on that tour. And they did it like, you know, kind of like they plucked out certain songs and then just wove it into like a mini a mini set playing it all in a row there. Uh, they played this uh, tour. They played it in Toronto and Buffalo. And then, uh, you know, fantastic show. Um, this album is definitely, uh, like you said, and, you know, obviously they did, a whole, they did a whole Broadway musical on this show. So, I mean, this, yeah. you know, you know, to do and all a, that. And a film, you know. So yeah. it's, it's, again, they've, they've really gotten a lot of mileage out of it. But uh, it's, it's kind of, I think it's just a, it's just a great record. Yeah. Definitely. So that was my number two. And then uh, your number three. So what do you got for your number two? My number two is uh, Can You See the Real Me? Quadrophenia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I vacillate, I think, between uh, Tommy and Quadrophenia. I mean, said I could interchange it. So sometimes I'm, I'm more in the mood for Quadrophenia and sometimes uh, more in the mood for Tommy. I think Quadrophenia tends to win me over more just because it's just got more oomph to it. I don't know. There's just, there's just a, there's just a power to some of the songs on Quadrophenia. Uh, my favorite who song from their catalog is uh, love rain or me. It It's just a, just an incredible song. Five fifteen is another one. Uh, the real me. I mean, it just, I think probably uh, one of the reasons that this is such a great record is because, because it really, really showcases John Entwistle's bass playing. I think this is probably Entwistle's best performance on any Who record. And uh, really him and Moon are just so locked tight as a rhythm section. It just takes the material and just really just gives it a lot of, a lot of oomph. So uh, Quadrophenia, <clears throat> I think more so than you know, Tommy is a record that, man, I can just, I can turn that sucker up to 11 and just really just want to, you know, pump my fist in the air and just, just a, just a fun, fun record. Very, sonically just very, I mean, you know, mix, the mix of the vocals and the instrumentation, everything, songwriting. I mean, it's just, the whole thing just really comes together. Yeah, this one, um, for me is number three uh obviously I, I so i had tommy ahead of it but yeah like you said depending on the day of the week you know and how you feel and what kind of mood you're in this could definitely those two can easily flip flop there's no flip flop in my number one there's no that's the one thing i'm going to put my foot down right now but number two and three you can always flip flop these two um you know obviously this one was, re was recorded you know, really well, much better sound. They had better equipment, you know, yeah. you know, obviously it was four, four or five years later down the road. I think it was Tommy in 69 and this was 73. So yeah, you had more technology was better. So obviously, you know, there was a lot more that helped play into this album to make it sonically sound so great. 
definitely one of yeah. those albums you got to put the headphones on oh for sure yeah absolutely you know? it, it, it's uh it's an intense it's an intense album i mean it really is i mean it's that i you know uh i've mentioned pink floyd the wall i mean that's that's another you know record that just really tells a very interesting tale but just the way it's put together is so amazing i think quadrophenia is uh quadrophenia tommy the, the wall i mean those are three just incredible records you know i think rush was really good at that too i mean 2112 i mean even though it was just the one side for that song they were able to kind of create those epics but uh man i don't know quadrophenia it just I don't know, to me it's just like if you were to introduce somebody to the who that had never heard them before uh, you could really just put on quadrophenia and they would they would kind of get it you know what i mean um it it, it really does kind of capture them at, at at their greatest you know yeah so the, the you know this album is definitely uh the follow-up to the album that we're going to be talking about soon here very soon <laughs> yeah um, yeah you know, you can't really take anything away. I mean, you know, follow up to probably their greatest album to be this good is, you know, most people, a lot of times, like when a band comes up with such a great album, it's always a letdown, always a letdown. I mean, classic example, REO Speedwagon, High Infidelity, sold millions and zillions of copies, and then they come up with Good Trouble, which to me, Good Trouble, great album, just never got the airplay. It really deserved. But, you know, in comparison to High Infidelity, that that just, <laughs> you can't really compare it. It was a major letdown to all the fans yep. who liked High Infidelity. But in this case, you know, no matter how much you liked Who's Next, this one definitely stayed in the same level, same playing yep. field and everything. You know, it, it's a long album. It's got a lot of different, uh, you know, different things on it. It's got some instrumentals. It's got some, uh, you know, a lot of sound effects. Um, you know, I am the sea. Uh, you hear that sea roaring and everything and all this uh, great sound sound effects and everything. Is it in my head? Um, drowned. You know, some great stuff. And then the, who can forget Bellboy? <laughs> Keith's theme, yeah. you know, with Daltrey and Moon on a rear... Um, you know, he didn't do a lot of singing with the band, but that's one of those things that, uh, you know, he stood out on there. And, of course, Dr. Jimmy, another great song that, uh, you know, you hear that one on the radio every now and then still these days. Yep. Uh, and, they, of course, they end it with what you call your favorite Who song, Love Rain Over On Me. You know, it's just perfection, you know, perfection that is only, that's only uh, beaten by its predecessor and which we're going to get into right now <laughs> let's have yeah, it which is number one which is uh who's next and uh you know the 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 failed lighthouse project <laughs> and uh it could have been i mean this you know you know this is a record that could have been the one of three rock operas and i, and I think you know kind of goes back to what we we're talking about with quadrophenia what's uh what's interesting about quadrophenia is that you know townsend i mean townsend does tommy and then he I think he, he always kind of felt the pressure to come up with another epic like Tommy. And uh, this was supposed to be that epic. It was supposed to be a, it's, it's a crazy story. And, and uh, I guess nobody, he tried to pitch it to the band and nobody understood it. It had something to do with, uh, there's that song pure and easy, which I believe is usually a, a bonus track. It's not on the uh, original tracking. And then it came on some Townsend stuff, but talking about this one, you know, perfect musical note that somehow, unifies the world or it's you know something something to that effect and uh, he never was was able to quite have it have it come together because i think he was discouraged by the fact that you know when he pitched it to people they were like what what are you talking about man this this is just a crazy story you know well, how about we just record some songs and hope for the best so uh but yeah i mean you got one could fooled again i mean if that was the only song on the album it would still be considered the top uh <laughs> You know, it, it's interesting on the bonus, I, I actually have the vinyl, which has the, uh, the like an extra record with it that has some bonus material on it. And it's got an early version. I won't get fooled again. Mm -hmm. And it was performed live before uh, anybody had heard it. So, you know, you, how you get to that midsection, you're like, yeah, 
you know, the, 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 it's funny because the crowd is just really not into it. I think they don't know what to make of it. But now, I mean, you see that song live and it's just like, to me, it's, I mean, if we were ever to come up with a list of like 20 songs you need to see perform live <laughs> you know, or you miss the chance to, uh, that would certainly be one of them, you know, and it, it's just, just such an incredible moment. And of course, Bob O'Reilly, which, you know, most people know is the song Teenage Wastelands. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't know. This is just another record. You listen to it beginning to end and you just go, damn, like, well, how does this, how does one guy have so much great material? But, uh, but they do. And, and you know, I, again, I think this is another record that really, really stands up the test of time. I mean, all these songs still pack a lot of punch and, uh, you know, very cohesive performance. Um, even though it's, you know, not a rock opera or two record set or any of that kind of stuff, it still is just, I mean, it's, it's a classic. One of the greatest albums ever recorded by any band, period. I mean, if, if, you know, you call the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, they're epic, then, then this is the who's next has got to be in that same discussion as far as really the peak of the who, which, I mean, some people would probably say, you know, Tommy was the who's Sergeant Pepper, but I think you can make the, the case that who's next was probably a, a, a greater pinnacle creatively. Oh yeah. This, this album helps pretty much help set the stage for the seventies rock. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is, you know, this, them is, and Led this, is this is classic rock e e epitomized for the 1970s. This is this, this record. I agree with you hundred percent, even this more is, so than Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this album, you know, not only are you getting like some new sounds with this uh, Bob O'Reilly, the way he used that keyboard and everything there. Um, you know, if you're looking at the album, you see Love Ain't For Keeping. If you look at that song, yeah, yeah. you go, man, you know, that's like the weakest song on the album, but it's great. You know, it's like yep. there's not a, there's not another song weaker than that on the album, but you can't really knock that song because it's great. Um but I feel this album has probably two of my 10 favorite songs of all time on it. And this is saying a lot because these two songs that I'm talking about aren't your everyday songs that you hear on the radio. Um, if you ever hear these two songs on the radio, it's a golden treat. And the two songs I'm talking about <laughs> are, are definitely two of... Uh, Two of the greatest vocal performances I've ever come across, and and we're talking uh, getting in tune, uh, Roger Daltrey's mm. lead vocals, yep. and of course the mixed vocals there between uh, Pete and Roger on the song is over. Uh, I can't believe that 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 song is still not ever given its proper proper respect. Uh, that is just. If if there's you 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 give that song to somebody who never heard of the Who before, they'll be a fan for life. Oh oh yeah no I agree with you I mean it, it's uh, you know it said the vocal interplay between uh, Townsend and Daltrey is just it's just classic I mean it's it's uh, I I I think you know my favorite songs have the two of them singing it because their voices you know both of them are very strong singers. And I mean, Townsend on his own put out some great stuff, as did uh, as did Daltrey. But man, when the two of them kind of, you know, I love it when you have like that strong, gritty Daltrey vocal, and then you get that that nice kind of smooth, silky Townsend that that comes in, you know. Um, but yeah, the song is over. I mean, that's that's just uh, that's just great. I mean, that's just Townsend just singing his heart out. And then Daltrey, you know, I sing the song. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think that's a great vocal, vocal for performance from both of them. And uh, just a testament to what a what a great band they are, you know. Yeah, and then we didn't even start talking about, like, Behind Blue Eyes. and Behind Blue uh, Eyes know. made Perfect Cut. I mean, that's yeah. just, you know. And then don't forget Entwistle's yeah. great song, My Wife. Yep. You know, another, yeah. another one that just, uh, you know, probably has actually – to see him sing that one live, that was definitely uh, a great song. There, he's yeah. You know, he Boris... almost you know he almost sounds like Daltrey on that one. You know, when you first hear it, you almost uh, you don't know that it's Entwistle. I mean, his his vocals are, are that strong on that song. I agree. With you. I think that I, yeah. I mean, we could talk about this record forever. I mean, people that uh, have heard it understand how great of a record it is. You know. 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, like you said, that whole Lifehouse project, you know, for a failed project, you know, this thing, <laughs> this thing yeah. came out of the ashes of that. Man, oh man, you know, if that's, if you can get an album out of a project that was aborted, <laughs> and uh, like you said, there's a lot of B sides that were on the uh, remastered versions of these albums. Uh, you know, like you were mentioning, Pure and Easy, uh, Water yep. was one that they used to do live. Uh, Naked Eye, you know, there's a lot of good songs okay, that just, yeah. yeah, there's just a lot of good songs. Had they been on this album, jeez, we'd be talking. Yeah, yeah, I said it, 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 yeah. it's, it's interesting to think that uh, that Pete couldn't pull it together as a, a, a kind of a rock opera, but I, th but I think in some ways it's uh, probably a good thing that it didn't because I, I don't know, I can't picture this record in any other form. It's just right. Said that the individual tracks are so strong that they don't need a common thread to pull them together. They're just, they're, they're just great. I mean, I, I think in some ways the, that who are you was, was in that similar vein in, in terms of just, you know, a group of really strong songs and they didn't need, they didn't necessarily need the theme to, to make them great, you know? And uh, you know, you look at, you look at Tommy, you look at Quadrophenia as, as a, as a whole great works of art. But in terms of just songs and song craft, you know, who are you and who's next to me are really, they kind of, uh, there are those kind of records where you could pull one or two tracks out of them. They're just, they're great. I mean, they're, that's the kind of stuff that's uh, filling your set list or feeding your greatest hits or best of compilations. So great stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah, another one that, you know, you can just turn up to 15 and, and just love listening to it. Shake the windows. <laughs> Shake the windows, baby. <laughs> I haven't heard that expression. I like that. I'm gonna use I'm gonna use that one. This record but, shakes the windows. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, the bottom line is, you know, the Who definitely are one of those ones. Uh they're definitely one of the four, you know, important parts of the British invasion as they called it back in the day there. Yeah. Um the Beatles, the Kinks, the Stones, the Who, those are the four that, you know, even when we're long and gone and buried and people will still be talking about those four bands, you know, they they did, they did created such a legacy that will just live on forever, basically. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, sad part is, I mean, you wish that they're, I mean, I, I shouldn't say sad, but it's just, it's mind boggling that some of these groups can have such a, a small catalog, you know, I mean, you, you look at the amount of time that they were together and, you'd think they would have put out more music, but they didn't need to. Like, I mean, it, you know, you, you, you kind of get to a point in your career where there's no room to put more songs in your set list and you can, you can live off of the early stuff. So we mentioned the Eagles, you know, they're one of those bands that hasn't really had to record an album over the last 30 years. And the who's been in that same category. I mean, nobody seems to mind that yeah. they're playing stuff that's 30 years old. They're still <laughs> filling arenas and still stadiums uh, yeah <laughs> you know still doing well i mean the stones they manage to put out records every now and then but uh yeah this is uh i don't know i, I but i to me i i think the difference between the who and the stones and um the beatles is you know the beatles and the stones were definitely the 60s like they were they defined the 60s but i think that that the who and on to some level the kinks uh, the Kinks, I think, had sort of a little bit of the best of both worlds. They had a really good heyday in the '60s, but then I think they put out some really strong material in the in the late '70s and early '80s as well. Uh, whereas the Who, I mean, they really kind of peaked in the in the mid '70s, early to mid '70s. They were just they were just on fire. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember too, the Stones and the Kinks never really. You know, they were together like for years uh, without yeah. any break. The Who, obviously, the Beatles were only around till like 1970, but the the Kinks went all the way to about 1995 before they stopped doing anything. Um, you know, and they haven't done nothing since, unfortunately. The Who took breaks. You know, obviously, after 82, they really didn't do anything till 89. Yep. Other than I think they did a, like a Live Aid or something, you know, nothing drastic they didn't record they didn't really tour and then you know obviously the stones have been not non-stop <laughs> they're the ones that have pretty much been there all all the whole time 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, they've always kind of put out albums sporadically. I mean, they haven't been yeah. as prolific as some of the other bands, but you know, the Kinks. I said the Kinks. You know, the Kinks just really they were to me. You know, I think the the Kinks had those two really strong eras where they had those great kind of early British Invasion hits. The you really got me in all day and all the night. And then I, you know, the later stuff, do it again, destroyer, very strong. Um, and the who, you know, I said, I mean, what 1982 was their first breakup. I mean, really that was the end of the who in terms of being a, an active recording band, you know, and then uh, everything else kind of, the wheels just kind of fell off. And, and that's not to say that, that there haven't been some great live performances. I mean, there's a live at Hyde Park show that came out, I don't know, five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. a lot of energy a lot of good everything sounds great um but you know i said they really and and i think that 2019 album i think it was uh, i think it was good but you know it's not something that they're gonna add five or six songs into their set from either it's right. it's just kind of a yeah we got time maybe we'll put out another record because we got some stuff laying around but you know but eh, whatever i mean i wish i could have five or six albums as good as <laughs> 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 yeah, as good as anything on their list as yeah. long as it wasn't endless wire that one yeah. i can you know i just yeah. i just really hate that album <laughs> all right well let's wrap it up here um you know obviously uh first video of 2022 and uh you know we're going to come up with an idea for the next show i think uh i like the idea of kind of sticking with this um british invasion theme here <laughs> So maybe we'll... yeah yeah or you know you know one of these days we should come up with a uh best and worst follow-up to a great album because i think we kind of touched on that one today it'll be interesting because i know we did a, a set of live albums and uh I, I think it's you know i think it's fascinating to think about like I said you know what's the follow-up to you know all the big ones we think about you know who's next sergeant pepper Mario Speedwagon, Fleetwood Max, Rumors. I mean, all the, all these records that kind of, you know, they had this just this big record, and then, you know, what did they do as a follow up? I think there's a, there may be something there, but yeah, who knows? definitely, definitely. All right, man, sounds good. Good seeing you, and uh, you know, we'll see you on the next episode out there. Yep, and next time I'll, I'll have fresh batteries so that I don't die in, <laughs> die in the one. We, we won't have the washing machine going for the first uh, quarter of the show either, which my wife didn't know was uh, creating all kinds of noise, which I oh. didn't think it would either. But this, I didn't hear you know, anything. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good because I heard it because this microphone picks up everything. So uh, um, I'm definitely enjoying this. But yeah, as always, I appreciate this. And uh, you know, everybody out there, make sure you're sharing, subscribing, and uh, commenting. Uh, you don't have to agree with us. Just be nice about it, right? Isn't that how it should be? Exactly. Be nicer then, than I am when talking about Endless Wire because I was a little harsh on that particular record tonight. Oh, boy. All right. Well, until <laughs> next time, guys, that's Joe and Tom signing off. All right, Take my care. friend. All right.